Hi, everybody. My name's Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here this morning, and I'm glad to be sober. <laughs> There's some new people in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous here this morning, and I hope the word being sober doesn't offend you as bad as it offended me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, when I said in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on the first Sunday in November 1959, and you talked to me about being sober, I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous had anything to offer me. I was as physically sober when I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as I am this morning, as physically sober. And that seemed to be my problem. If I could have got stayed loaded forever, I'd have never came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I kept getting interrupted out there on my happy road of destiny <laughs> by those people in those little black and white cars that said I was having too much fun. You know, it's an amazing situation that's going on today. People have big new things that they're starting to introduce to us. And one of the big new deals that they're talking about in Alcoholics Anonymous is intervention. I want to let you know that the Los Angeles County Sheriffs knew about it in 1940. <laughs> Intervention's no new deal to them guys, man, I'll tell you that. And if you don't believe that, just keep on going. It, in all, and I'm extremely pleased to be here this morning, fully clothed and in my right mind. <laughs> and I only tell you that because the longer I stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, the more necessary it becomes for me to remember from whence I came. And I never want to forget that a little over 30 years ago right now, I was crawling around on my knees in a cell in solitary confinement in a massive security penitentiary barking at the moon. Now, because of a loving God has expressed himself through this program called Alcoholics Anonymous, it's no longer necessary for me to crawl around on my hands and knees like an animal. If I don't get anything more out of this deal than that, I can live with that for a long time. I'd like to be able to stand here this morning and tell you without a shadow of a doubt that that's where alcohol and drugs took me to. Well, I'd love to be able to tell you that. But you see, that's where I took me to. The only thing that alcohol and drugs did in my life, they kept me alive long enough to find Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all. I'm as sure as I'm standing here without alcohol working in my life, I'd have blown my brains out before I was nine years old. I've always been some type of emotional misfit. I never seemed to belong anywhere. I just wandered around out there full of bitterness and hatefulness and anxiety and anger and frustration and ooh, just terrible feelings inside. I don't know where that came from. I always had that. It was just something that I just always remember having. I always remember having that feeling of uneasiness. I always remember having that feeling of knowing that something was wrong. Not knowing what it was, but something was wrong. It seemed like to me that I was just born needing an answer for something, and I didn't have it. And because I didn't have the answer, I was angry and hostile and bitter, and I didn't know what was going on. And everywhere I went, everything I did, everybody I saw was confusing. Now, I want to get something real clear, real quick. I am not Catholic. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, the Pope is tickled to death about that. <laughs> I don't know what my heritage is, My family weren't really all that well adjusted, I suppose. <laughs> they had a lot of fun, them folks. They made whiskey, they sold whiskey, they drank whiskey, and they did the things that people who did that kind of stuff did. They all drank whiskey. Everybody in my family drank whiskey. They made whiskey and they sold whiskey. And they used to gather up on Saturdays and beat each other half to death. They stole each other's whiskey and each other's women. And God, whoever was survived that week was the king, I guess. I don't know how they worked that deal out. See, I understood that. I understood that very well. I understand that violence and that anger and that hot. I understand it real well. Makes you, you know, you put your foot into somebody. Just, it's almost like a spiritual experience. It just pulls off. I understand that. 
when you're full of anger and bitterness and hostility and all that, you can understand whipping on somebody. Just, ooh. You know what, I mean? what I was never able to understand was is how these same people who did that on Saturday could put their arms around one another on Wednesday and say, we love one another because we're family. And I guess I said to myself, I don't know. I guess I said to myself, if that's what love is, you can keep it. I don't need it. Because I don't ever remember uttering the word to any other human being who lived upon the face of this earth before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. The word love was not of my vocabulary. And the reason the word of love was not in my vocabulary, you see, I'm a taker. I'm a taker of things and I'm an abuser of people, so therefore I'm a loser. I'm selfish, I'm self-centered, and I'm self-serving, and I got an ego bigger than this whole room. Now you don't need much more than that couple with a bad attitude to have a bad start in life. It seems like you're going to get headed into trouble right there. And you see, if I ever told anybody that I loved them, that means I gave them an edge. And takers don't give people edges. Takers take. Takers don't love. Takers use. I used up every single thing and every person who ever came into my life prior to coming to Alcoholics Now. I used them up. I didn't drink them up. I used them up. I burned them up and I threw them away when I was through with them and they had no more to offer me. And that's the way I lived my entire lifetime. I didn't know that. But I started looking for a way out of this situation a long, long time ago because I knew I wasn't supposed to feel that way. And I knew I wasn't supposed to think the way I thought. And I didn't know what was going on. I had this terrible conflict inside me. I didn't know what, so I started looking for a way out. I looked up one day, and my grandmother stood there. Now, my grandmother was a kindly old lady. She lived till she was almost 90 years old, my grandmother. She never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in her life. So me staying sober for 29 years is no really big deal. Grandma didn't drink for 90. <laughs> and they didn't give her any standing ovations, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Grandma would just sit around in there and sing songs to Jesus. That's what Grandma did. She was a strange old broad, really. She was really, <laughs> that's the truth. I mean, Grandma, Grandma was a candidate for Al-Anon before there was Al-Anon. I don't know what it, I seem like to me that every morning she just got up on the cross and hung there for a while. Start her day off, you know? That's the way Grandma appeared to me, I don't know. But Grandma would be sitting in there in this kitchen. I'd be sitting there with Grandma in the kitchen, and she'd be singing songs to Jesus, and these crazy people would come flying through there. You know, blood dripping from them, their shirts ripped off of them, their eyes black, one kicking the other one, and Grandma would just, yes, Jesus loves you, you know. Okay, hey, Granny. So Grandma took me where she went. I wanted to go where Grandma went because I wanted to be like Grandma. I don't want to be like these other bums. I want to be like Grandma. So I went with Grandma. But I never figured out a one very simple little thing. Wherever I went, I went. <laughs> I know that's a little heavy for seaside, but try to hang on to it, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's about as deep as I get, folks. I'm gonna let you know that right now. You've had already had the intellectual talks already. <laughs> the ones who were educated by the Roman Catholics. <laughs> you know, you know, I was, I was educated by the Whittier State Reform School. It's, <laughs> that's the way I live. But my grandmother took me to this place, and I remember sitting in that room with my grandmother, full of excitement and anticipation on a Sunday a long, long time ago. I'm different, and I'm strange, and I'm miserable, and I hate everybody in the room. I don't know what's going on. And I sit there and wait for a man to mount a rostrum in his robes of authority to tell me what's the matter with me. That's what I wanted to know. What's the matter with me? The question I always ask, good God, what's the matter with me? I didn't know. I guess even more important than what I wanted to do that morning is to tell me what to do about what was the matter with me, because I didn't know. I just needed some instructions, that's all. And the guy stood at that podium that morning and he confused me. He told me I was supposed to love and honor and respect my parents. He said, you're supposed to love your brothers and your sisters, and I didn't, I hated them. I hated them for reasons I didn't even understand. God, I felt guilty about that. I became frightened to death sitting in that church a long, long time ago that people were going to find out I was hating when I was supposed to be loved and I didn't know what to do about that. Turned to walk outside the door of the church that day, the old man's down there drunk and hung over and he tapped me on the head and said, son, you continue to go to church, you're going to grow up to be just like me. 
I really don't know what that did for my old man, but I haven't been back to church since. <laughs> and they ain't got anything to do with church, got to do with my old man. I didn't want to be like my old man. My old man was a drunk. I didn't like my old man. I hated my old man. My mother was a drunk. I hated my mother. I lived in a house where there were two drunks working. It's not a nice place for little kids to grow up in. It's a frightening place. In that house in the middle of the night, they're screaming and yelling and cussing and flesh hitting flesh and breaking furniture and deadly silence. Every once in a while, the old man come and got me and started kicking me around. He didn't do it to my brothers. He did it to me. And that's not the most frightening kind. The most frightening kind is when they're gone somewhere. And I know they're out there, and I know they're coming in. And I know what's going to happen. So I lay there and I think. I sometimes get behind my older brother. We live in this little one-room shack. And I'd get between my older brother and the wall so they wouldn't find me because I knew what was going to happen. And I lay there and think about my uncles who lived in penitentiaries. I thought about my aunts who worked in those houses on the other side of the tracks. I thought about my old man who beats up my mother, my mother who beats up my old man. I thought about all those kind of things. It dawned on me what the problem was sitting back there one night. It's alcohol. They drink, these people, and they do these things. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to be like them. I'm going to be better than they are. I'm going to step out into that world. I'm going to have something. I'm going to do something, and I'm going to be something. What do you do if you're weird? <laughs> I don't know what you did. I took a drink. <laughs> it's exactly what I did. I don't remember uh, any decision on my part about it. I just got into my old man's bootleg hooch one day and took a drink. And what happened to me that day, I became enslaved to a feeling that I pursued into the gates of insanity and death and beyond. Not to alcohol. The feeling I got when I drank alcohol. That's what kept me enslaved for the next 20 years of my life. That's what I pursued into the gates of insanity and death and beyond. Was the feeling I got when I drank alcohol. See, this stuff went down inside of me. And it stilled the screaming madness. It took me from the black pit of nothingness, stood me into the gray fringes of the business of living. It installed in me an arrogance that said, damn you world, it's all right. I'm not good enough to be around the good people, but I'm too good to be around the bad people. It's okay right here. That's what alcohol did for me. If alcohol still did that, I would still drink it. And the reason it doesn't do that anymore, the reason I don't drink alcohol, and the reason I don't use drugs anymore is because they don't work. That's as simple as I know how to tell you. The sad part about my life is they quit working 10 years before I knew they did. I spent the last 10 years of my life running around out there trying to find the answer and end up a hypodermic needle 10 years after it quit working. Now, I want to tell you something this morning. If hell is any hotter than that, I hope I never go there. I can't remember hell. I, hell couldn't be any more torturous than that, than to have to live in that nightmare that I lived in for the last 10 years of my life when my answer is no longer an answer and I don't have one and I'm going crazy, drifting in and out of sanity. What happened to me in the next 20 years of my life happened to me every time I drank. Nothing ever changed in my life. I took a drink of alcohol and three days later they pulled me out from underneath the bridge, stood me in front of a judge and sent me to the Hutchison State Reform School. Twenty years later, I took a drink of alcohol. They pulled me out of a car in Compton, stood me in front of a judge, and sent me to 20 years in the penitentiary. That's what happened to me when I drank. I got drunk and went places. I traveled around out there. I went from reform school to reform school to junior penitentiaries to penitentiaries to nut houses. Oh, nut houses. They call them treatment centers today. <laughs> Society has a way of whitewashing anything that sounds offensive to them. I guess they're as sensitive as we are. How would you like to go down there and say, my insurance policy says I can come to the nut house and get shock treatments? I'm not going to get many buyers for that, baby, I'll tell you that. You may do it the first time, but you'll never go back with that second series of electoral therapy as a way of stimulating most everything that happens to you in your life. You'll notice that my hair still stands up from time to time when I get near electric things. <laughs> Some things you never forget. I'm sitting on a furlough from a reform school when I'm nine or ten years old and alcohol's not working. I don't know what to do about that. 
I'd sit there and drink a whole gallon of Marco Petri red wine. I'm sober as I am right now, scared to death. I don't know what happened. And a guy tapped me on the shoulder and said, why don't you try these? And he gave me some pills. I don't remember saying to him, what are those? <laughs> Do you think they'll bother me if I take them? <laughs> Thank God they weren't x lax that's all I can tell you. Hell, I could stand here this morning, I'd have a whole new 12-step program to work through one of them joints, you know Called Laxatives Anonymous. Hell, we'd get a lot into that deal, you know what I mean? I could be standing here this morning as an adult child of a laxative taker. I would have been functional, but mother was on the toilet all the time when I was little. All I can tell you is that stuff worked, for Christ's sake. If it worked, I used it. I didn't ask what it was. Work. I'm sitting on a pillow from a reform school and I'm 11 or 12 years old and I'm eating pills and drinking wine, nothing's working, the guy stuck a needle in my arm. And for the next 14 years of my life, I stuck needles in my arm, ran in out of institutions. That's what I do. I live out there in them streets and I do what's necessary to survive in them streets. What I did in them streets, if you had something I wanted, I took it. I didn't care whether you liked it or not, I took it. Whatever I had to do to survive out in them streets, I did it to survive out in them streets. I had no conscious concern, no conscious thought, no conscious idea or about anybody else upon the face of this earth, only my own well-being. That's all I was concerned about. I lived in a total world of selfishness and self-centeredness, self-serving. That's the only world I lived in. I didn't care about you. I didn't care about them. I had no concern for anybody. I cared about not my family. I didn't care about anybody. I cared about my own well-being. If I use you, fine. When I got through with you, you were history. And people who live like that don't last very long in the world. I burned up and used up everything. I cared about nothing who lived upon the face of the earth save one thing. My baby brother. If I was capable of caring about anything in my life before I found you or before you found me, it was my baby brother. In 1951, I'm on my way to the penitentiary and I'm staying in the old Los Angeles County Jail and my mother's screaming at me through the visiting screen that I'm a murderer. It seems that my 17-year-old brother had gotten into some of my poison and took an overdose of it and died. I don't know how to handle that very well. I handle like I handle most things that got mad at it made it go away. I stood handcuffed between two detectives three days later while they buried the only thing in the world I cared anything about. With all the guilt and shame and humiliation and degradation of a lifetime, Hanging around my shoulders, I'd have liked to have cried, but I didn't know how. I didn't have the simple gift of tears that God gives every creature that's born on the face of this earth, and the reason I didn't have them because I didn't think they were necessary. I went on to the penitentiary and I stayed there four and a half years. I came out of there four and a half years sicker than I was when I went in there. You see, my disease doesn't get better just because I get locked up somewhere. It gets worse. My disease is worse now than it was when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a progressive illness. I'm getting constantly worse, even though I haven't had a drink of alcohol or a mood all in chemical in my system for over 29 years, four months, and some odd days. I'm still worse off than I was the last time I took it. <laughs> now, I haven't got anything to do with that. That's not anything of me that happened. That's nothing to my credit. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous of my own free will. I don't take any credit for coming here. I remember sitting down with a psychiatrist in San Quentin. I remember the psychiatrist saying to me, Johnny, people like you don't change. You're doomed to die in an institution. He took me down, he showed me a little green room, he says, you're going to end up here, hot shot, and I told him, not me, I'm different. I'm different. The theme song of the alcoholic, I'm different. That's going to kill 95% of the people in this room today. The alcoholics in this room who are going to die drunk, some of us are, maybe me, I don't know. The ones of us who are going to die drunk, the alcoholics in this room are going to die drunk for one reason and one reason only, because their cases are different. That you don't have to do this nonsense that all the rest of us robots have to do. That's the ones who are going to die drunk. I may be one of them, you may be, I don't know. I can't look at you and say, oh, you're going to die. I may be one of them, I don't know. There may come a time in my life, tomorrow or the next day, 
when my insanity will return, I'm saying, I'm tired of doing this nonsense. I won't do that anymore. Maybe, I don't know. But that's the reason. And if you're sitting here, no matter how long you've been sober, and you think your case is different, you're damn near drunk. You're not far from it, I can tell you that. That's what I've come to understand, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what kills alcoholics. Not alcohol. That thought in the back of their head that they're different, that they don't have to do what the alcoholics have to do to stay sober. That's a sad, sad thing about the alcoholic. Cases are different. It protected me for a long, long time. It kept me from getting a load of bother me in San Quentin because I was different. I come lost out of that institution and bound determined I had dead due beat and six months later I'm let in a nut house kicking and screaming. And that's when I made my round to some of the better laughing academies in the world interviewing psychiatrists. I had to sit around here with my wraparound overcoat on and talk to them. They talked to me about my mother and I talked to them about their mother. And they, <laughs> they introduced me to a thing called better living through electricity. <laughs> Said I had a bad attitude. I did have a bad attitude. You have a bad attitude too if they did that to you. I don't know. I don't think it's kind of, I don't think that's a way to treat a person just because they attack you. I drove across a desk one time at a psychiatrist in a straitjacket. That's exciting. <laughs> Take that to Not much of a win in them places, I'll tell you that. They got you wrapped up on them funny things with them wraparound overcoats on and you're trying to attack somebody. You really don't have much defense against the coming attraction. But that's the way I lived. I did that all the time. I just attacked everything I didn't understand. They didn't have any answers. I knew it. They thought they did. I knew they didn't. Very simple. And I remember that my last, what I pray God, is my last interview with psychiatrist. It was in a federal government hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. I never will forget it if I live to be 3,000 years old. I remember shuffling into this man's room and sitting down at his, across from his desk and looking up against the wall and looking at his degrees and his diplomas and his plaques and all these kind of things. Now, I want you to understand, I felt exactly that day the way I felt sitting at my grandmother's knee when I was a child. Nothing had changed. I still hated everything in the room. I was restless and I was irritable and I was discontent. Only now I've got one more problem that's worse than all the rest of those problems put together. Now the things I'm injecting into my system to make those problems go away no longer make them go away. Now I'm in deep trouble all the time. Now I can't get rid of the nightmares. Now I can't turn off the faces of the people I'd harm. Now I can't get rid of me at all. Now I'm in deep, deep trouble. And I sit across the desk from this guy and he looked at me and he said, Johnny, if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you wouldn't have any problems. When I was a kid in the Hutchison State Reform School, my counselor told me if I didn't drink, I'd be all right. He told me I was like my family. If I didn't drink, I'd be okay. When I was in the Whittier State Reform School, they told me if I didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, I'd be all right. When I was pressed in juvenile penitentiary, they told me if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you'd be all right. When I'm in San Quentin, they told me if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you'd be all right. When I was in Folsom, they told me if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, You'd be all right. What none of them ever, ever take into consideration, that every time they told me that, I was as physically sober as I am right now. As physically sober. How many times I wanted to scream out across them, good God, don't you understand? Because they don't understand. You take this madness from inside of me, I'll never have to put that stuff back in it. Make it 1950 again. I won't do that anymore. Bring back my baby brother. Take that nightmare away from me. I won't have to do it. Bring back all them countless faces of the people that harmed and destroyed. And I won't do these things anymore. Make the nightmares go away, doctor. But I didn't say that. 
I just looked at them and hated them because I didn't know. All I knew was that they were trying to tell me a nothing who had always been nothing, who come from nothing, who was nothing, who was going to be nothing, who put something in his system and became almost. That the thing I put into my system to make me a, almost from a nothing was a problem when I know the problem in my nothing. Like trying to tell the guy that building fell down because the elevator was defective. Didn't make any sense then and it doesn't make any sense now. What it proved to me without a shadow of a doubt, what the state of California and the federal government proved to me without a shadow of a doubt of treating me for 20 years, is how long they had me in their custody, how unique I was, that there wasn't anybody else upon the face of the earth like me. So I went back to Los Angeles to kill myself. That's what alcoholics like me do, you know, when we no longer have an answer and our answers are no longer answers. We kill ourselves. Alcoholics kill themselves cold sober. Alcoholics who kill themselves while drinking do it accidentally. We do it on purpose cold sober because we cannot stand sobriety. See, alcoholics can't stand sobriety. That's why they keep getting drunk. sobriety to me and the penalty I had to pay in my life prior to coming to you weren't half as severe as the penalties I had to pay when I was sober. The nightmares that I had to live in and the pain and the torturous things that I had to live in while I was sober was much more severe to me than the idea of going to the penitentiary or getting beat up and shot at and stabbed and kicked and electrocuted. But those weren't half as severe as the penalties I paid while sober. I didn't know that. A little over 31 years ago, they tied me down in a bed in the old Los Angeles County Jail. I weighed 128 pounds and I was yellow. And there was a medical doctor standing to put in my bed telling me I'm going to die. He said to me, son, you're going to die and nothing we can do for you. And I said, okay. All day passed and all night passed. He come wandering back in my room the next morning. He looked out at me and he said, son, you're going to die and there's nothing I can do for you. And I said, okay. The third day he came into my room, I had a terror grip me that I've never known before since in my entire lifetime. The idea came to me I was going to live and not die. I was going to get up out of that bed and go to the penitentiary and come back out and start that rat race all over again, and God knows I didn't want to do that. I laid in that bed for 18 days and 18 nights. I didn't eat, sleep, drink, or do anything. I just laid there. And one night, because I knew nothing better to do, I screamed out the only prayer I'd ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. I thought for a long, long time nothing had happened because there was no blinding flashes of light. Nobody come running down the hall with a dozen donuts and we got an A meeting down there. <laughs> I didn't get up and wander off into the room somewhere. I just went to sleep for a little while. And I don't know how many of you ever kicked a two-year heroin habit, but that's what I was doing. That's the first time I've been asleep in a long, long time. i tell you how sick I was. Just two weeks. Just two short weeks later. I'm up running around the jail looking for some more of the poison to put me back on the bed I'd just gotten off of. And there's a good reason for that, you see, because in the back of my mind where my problems seem to be centered, was the knowledge that once upon a time when I could not stand it any longer, when I could not stand anything any longer, I had inject something into my system and it made it okay right now. That's all. Right now, I've got it off me. Get it off me. Right now is what I want it off of me. Don't make it tomorrow. Now. And even though it wasn't working anymore, and I knew it wasn't working anymore, I knew it would if I could just find the right combination of things. It had always worked before, once upon a time. Good God, it has to work again. It's the only thing that ever had. And so I got loaded again. I stood in front of a Superior Court judge and was sentenced to 20 years in the penitentiary. I was told exactly what I was that morning. He called me a blood-sucking parasite in society. He told me I didn't have any right being around decent people. He told a woman who was sitting in that courtroom carrying my child that she cared anything at all about her child, she'd never let me lay eyes on it. And he didn't say anything to me that day that I didn't know. That's the only time I'd ever heard it. I spent a lifetime trying to masquerade that from the world, you and the people I was around, but I knew me. I knew what kind of a thing I was. 
I knew what kind of a sky, I knew what kind of a rock I crawled out from underneath. Nobody had to explain that to me. I had never heard it said before. I had never been exposed to that openly. The man's statement was so damning it literally drove me insane. I spent the next nine months of my life crawling around on that cell, drifting in and out of sanity, barking at the moon, more dead than alive. My brain gone, coming and going, drifting in and out of sanity. And on the first Sunday of November, 1959, on a Sunday morning, I wandered into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, I don't take any credit for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, nor do I take any credit for staying here from that day to this day. If I'd have known where I was coming, I wouldn't even have come. I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't know what an alcoholic was. The reason I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous was because the institution I didn't let women come in there. I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous over 29 years ago to smell perfume. And I've been honking and sniffing around here ever since. <laughs> you got to be careful what gets us sick folks in here, I'll tell you that. You open up them doors, one of us bent fenders are going to come flying in the door. I remember this, I moved in and sit down in the back row in what I lovingly like to call my throne of contempt. I had my coat collar up and my shades on because I was cool. If I'd have been any cooler when I got here, I'd have froze to death for God's sake. <laughs> I remember looking up on the backboard, I saw two big gates and I thought to myself, my God, I wandered into an anti-aircraft brigade. <laughs> I didn't know what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I said to this clown sitting next to me, what is this? He said, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. I sunk down in my seat. Gangsters weren't supposed to be hanging out with them wine over. If it had been Gangsters Anonymous or Over Hip Anonymous or how about this one? Dope Fiends Anonymous. Oh. Ah, that kind of makes addicts seem candy ass. You know what I mean, baby? Honey? Get it on. Be it, be it. Yeah. I thought, well, I'll wait for these women to get up and tell their racy stories. So you got to remember, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous 29 years ago, there weren't very many pretty young girls in Alcoholics. There just weren't. And these old gals got up to talk. And they said things like, I drank for a long, long time. You could look at them and know they'd been somewhere for a long, long time. <laughs> they said, I used to drink. I said, I'll bet you did. <laughs> Bad stuff, too. I knew. I had got the answer. I was a master, a master of cutting you off and cutting you down. A master, because you can't come in then. You just keep you out of here. Sickness in my pridefulness, that's what I was. I was so prideful I was dying in my differences. And my differences were getting sicker and I was getting sicker and my pride was getting bigger because I was prideful in my differences and I sit in means of Alcoholics Anonymous and and made fun of you and you talked about God and I ran out of the room. When I came here and you talked to me about God, I left because God was the reason I was. It was not my fault. I want you to understand that. See, I had run out of everything else to blame. I'd run out of every person, people, places, and things, circumstances, and conditions to blame for my dilemma. I had nothing left, so I blamed God. See, when you don't have anything left to blame for your dilemma, you can blame God for it. You don't talk back. If you listen real careful sometimes in the club rooms in Alcoholics Anonymous, you can hear that. You'll hear things like, I guess if God wants me to have a job, he'll shoot it down here to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Next time you get hungry, you go lock yourself up in a closet and pray for a hot dog. <laughs> if God squirts you one through the keyhole, call me. See, I've been active and close to an Alcoholics Anonymous for over 29 years now, and I haven't learned very much about God. I'm not a spiritual giant because I had no, I had no formal education, no formal religious training. I was indoctrinated. I had no false ideas about what God was when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous. All I've ever learned about God is what I've learned from you. And what I've come to learn about my God is this, that God will not do anything for me that I can do for myself. There's only been one 
single thing in my entire life I have never been able to do. One thing and one thing only. Of myself and by myself, I cannot keep from taking a drink. I can't do that. But yet, for over 29 years and four months and some odd days, I haven't ingested any type of chemicals in my system, not even aspirin. And what blows my mind even more than that is, I haven't had a conscious thought or a conscious desire to put any of that nonsense in my system from the first moment I laid eyes on you to this instant. But that doesn't make me wonderful. My God seemed to understand that as sick as I am, I cannot harbor a thought in my head for over 30 seconds without putting it into action. God knows how sick I am. I don't have to tell you, he knows. And he gives me all the protection I need. All I have to do is do what his children do. And that's all I've ever done. I didn't know what was going on in Alcoholics Anonymous. I kept coming back to meetings because they kept telling me these strange people came up there every week. Different groups of people kept coming up there. I kept going in there, they kept talking about God. I got up one Sunday a long, long time ago, went in and sat in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with my coat collar up and my shades on and my bad attitude. And I sat back there and a man stood at a podium like this, very much like this, who had done 23 or 5 years in the penitentiary and told me something I've never forgotten. It makes more sense to me than anything that I know. It'll make more sense to me tomorrow than anything I'll ever learn. He said, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. He says, you don't have to do it like this no more. And nobody ever told me that. They've been telling me all my life, don't drink, swallow, smoke, and shoot. But they didn't tell me how to live without doing it because they don't know. How do you live in a world that you don't belong to? That wants no part of you and you don't want any part of. And the only thing that makes it bearable for just an instance is when you ingest something into your system. After the meeting, I went up to this little guy, and I said to him, Les, the strange thing about this is, this little guy used to be my manager when I played baseball for the San Quentin Pirates. I was a star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates for two years running. Stick that on your resume sometime and try to see how it flies. <laughs> Here he is, this little guy, and I walked up to him, I said, Les, how do you learn how to live? That's all I want. That's all, I want. That's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in anything else. I'm only interested in how do you live. He told me about a book. This book, called Alcoholics Not. He said, Johnny, if you go get that book, I'll go home and pray that you find some part of you in it. I guess he's prayed real hard, that little fella because I've been a student of the book Alcoholics Anonymous from that day to this day. And the only thing I've ever found in that book is me. I haven't looked for anything else. I'm not looking for a way to sober up the world or cure all society's ills. I'm looking for a way to live peacefully and comfortably and joyously with me and the love of God that made me. Now the strange phenomena that takes place in my life, and I really don't know anything about anybody else's life if you really want to know the truth, and neither does anybody else. It seems like to me that the closer I adhere to the principles that are written in this book, and the more willing I become to share that knowledge in this fellowship, just for the sheer joy of doing it, the more peaceful and the more comfortable and the more joyous I live with me and the loving God that made me. But I had a lot of trouble when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I was confused here. I didn't understand what was going on. I'm drifting in and out of sanity all the time. My brain is half gone, and I'd hear things I didn't understand, and people would get up at podiums like this, well-meaning people, I'm sure, and they would say things like, I used to drink, now I don't drink anymore, and everything is wonderful. <laughs> and I'd say to myself, I guess I'm not an alcoholic then. I'm not drinking either, and I'm crazy. God, I wish I was an alcoholic. If I could just be an alcoholic, if it was just that simple. But you don't understand. I'm not, I'm sober as that clown is, and I'm not. And then they said, you've got to get active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I heard that. So I got up and ran around like a chick with my head cut off. Okay? I picked up ashtray, poured coffee, and smiled. The newcomer smiled. What? <laughs>
welcome, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> if, you, if you come in and climb these golden stairways to happiness, you can join us spiritually magnificent people also. <laughs> uh, I got here 30 days ago and it's just wonderful. And then I went back and set an inventory point and died. I was doing what they told me to do and I'm crazy. Nothing's happening for me. So I said to myself, it's logic. It's pure logic. I am not an alcoholic. If I was an alcoholic, all I would have to do is not drink and pick up these damned ashtrays and I'd be okay. But there's something far more wrong with me than that. I'm crazy. And every time I talk to somebody, they said, oh, it's in the book. <laughs> What's in the book? <laughs> oh, it's there. You go look for it. <laughs> but what is it? Oh, look for it on page 82. <laughs> for the benefit of you newcomers this morning, I'm going to take that mystery away from you. I'm going to tell you what it is. <laughs> what it is, is what I thought it was, <laughs> but it really wasn't. <laughs> when I took my first drink. What it is, but it really wasn't. It's what I thought it was when I swallowed my first pill. What it is, but what it wasn't, but what I thought it was when I stuck that needle in my arm for the first time. What it is, is that peace that I was born without. What it is, is the thing I had looked for all my life. What it is, is that seemingly missing link in that puzzle of life that I had no answer for, that I searched the world over in every dredge and filthy, corruptible place in this world. What it was, is I found a living God who lived inside of me. I became my father's child, and I didn't know that. Filthy, corruptible thing I'd ever done in my life. And during that conversation with that man, I heard myself say to that man, I am an alcoholic. I had never said it before. I was always something else and. I was always this and that and and. And this and and that and and this. And all that did for me really was it separated me from you. It made me different. As long as I was an alcoholic and, you see, because I come to understand that day, from way down deep inside of me there came a freedom that I carry with me to this instant. I know what's wrong with me. I am an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic and anything. When I was an alcoholic and something, I couldn't have your program. And the reason I couldn't have your program is because I separated me from you. I was different than you. I did not have to do what you do. I did not have to do what the 100 people who wrote this book had to do, who put it down for dummies like me to pick up and do. I didn't have to do that. But you see, when I became just like you, I had to do whatever it was that you had to do. If I wanted to obtain and maintain enough peace within me that I don't have to drink to calm the storm, screaming madness that goes on inside of me. I have to do what you have to do to keep my selfishness and my self-centeredness down enough where I can live comfortably enough out there in that world one day at a time till I get back here and get my medicine. Just alcoholic. Not alcoholic and nothing. If you're sitting in this thing and you're separating yourself from our program by that little funny differential thing of and uh, for God's sake, close that door and come on in. Come on in. Come join us. Just be one among many. 
Father, I would like to live in peace and not have to outstand and be outstanding. Funny things started to happen to me after that. I had to start writing letters about making amends. It's another thing that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous that I observe sometimes. People are always writing inventories. I think it would be a lot better if they went ahead and did the eighth and ninth step. You know, it's a lot easier to go back and redo something than it is to go forward. I remember not long ago, I was going to go do a retreat up here somewhere, and I was telling Clancy about it. I said, Clancy, I'm going to go do a retreat. And he said, wait a minute, kid. And Alcoholics Anonymous were supposed to advance, <laughs> not retreat. <laughs> True. We're supposed to grow along spiritual lines if I'm supposed to believe what this book says. It has been the only tool I've used in the 29 years since I've been here, this book. I've come to understand there's a vast difference between our program of recovery and our fellowship. Big, big difference. Program of recovery is perfect. This book, the first 164 pages of this book, is a design for living this perfect construction and foolproof and application. Anybody who applies those principles to their lives will get better. I don't care who they are. Anybody. Nobody lives so well that you couldn't apply these principles in their life and get better. But you see, your fellowship is different. <laughs> fellowship is made up of people like me and you. And what I've come to learn here is all people have feet of clay. All people have feet of clay. They made one perfect person that I know about, and they hung him on a piece of wood one time a long time ago. You know that perfection frightens people like me? I'm frightened of perfection. I can't love perfection. I'm frightened of it. I don't understand it. There was an old man that I ran around with who was like a father to me that I loved probably more than any man that I've ever loved in my life. His name was Chuck. And I used to sit and ride around in cars with him when he went to meetings when I was new. And I'd sit in this big old Lincoln. He had a big old Lincoln as long as that screen. <laughs> and I'd sit over there in the corner and look at him. He was magnificent. Magnificent man. He just walked into a room and the went, oh. And I... Well, I, and I was frightened of him. And he loved me like his kid. He put me on his lap and rocked me to sleep, called me his son. Loved me like his son. And I was frightened of him. And one night we're coming back from Santa Barbara from a meeting he was uh, talking at, and, I, and he stopped in this little restaurant and had something to eat, and he got out and went to the glove compartment and took out some Rolaids. He swallowed them Rolaids, and I thought to myself, thank God he's got gas. <laughs> I loved him, so I like him. Not because he was perfect, but because he was a human being. And when Jerome was talking about his daddy yesterday, about he had to go sit with his daddy when his daddy was dying, I spent the last year of my daddy's life sitting with him hugging him, loving on him, trying to give back to him what he'd give to me. I wouldn't trade that experience, that drive I made to Laguna Beach once a week for a year for all the tea in China. I sit there and watched him and told him he had to get up off his butt and go to meetings. He'd laugh and giggle at me. I watched a human being in action and I loved him more than anything that I know of when he died. I know about it being able to love somebody. I learned that here from you, by observing you, by observing what you do. That's what I have done here. People like you came into that penitentiary I was at and told me things like my vocabulary, which consisted of about four four-letter words. Mother ran all around in there. You told me things like cussing was a crutch for conversational cripples. <laughs> and then you stood my wrath when you corrected me. You told me things like, we don't say it that way, Johnny. We say it this way. You were more concerned with saving my life than you were in hurting my feelings. And I learned to love you, Lord. I was angry at you and hostile and bitter at you most of the time. But I've come to understand as an after fact how much you love me, how much love it takes to correct 
takes much more love to correct than it does to overlook and make allowances. It doesn't require any love to overlook some nonsense that you're doing. It takes love to have to love you enough to be willing to isolate me from you to tell you the truth. Somewhere in a book that was written a long time, it says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. But alcoholics like me don't want to hear the truth. We want some warped idea on what we think. We want some justification for the actions that we're taking. We want to be different. And so we die by the multitudes out there in the streets defending our rights to be different. And we come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they tell us we're just one among many. We got to be like everybody. You know that uh, on the 4th of June, 1961, I walked out of that penitentiary. I came out of that penitentiary before Jerome even took a drink. My wife said <laughs> that she was five years old when I was coming out of my first penitentiary. <laughs> I told her, well, I hope she's strong enough to hold up under the stress of it, for Christ's sake. See, some of these young people ain't got much going for them anymore. It's amazing what's happened to me since I've been hanging around you. See, I came out of that penitentiary not knowing what was going on. Never had I spent a day out there in them streets, out there in that world where you have to live sober. Well, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous teaches me how to live out there. See, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous teaches me to live out there. The traditions have taught me to live in here. There's a difference. With you, the traditions teach me how to live with you. The Steps have taught me to live out there with them. The traditions have taught me to live in here with you. I didn't know that. I came out of the penitentiary on the 4th of June, 1961, to a world I didn't know anything about. My mother fell off the steps blind drunk. I picked her up on a couch, put her on a couch, said, Mom, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, fine, I think you should. <laughs> My mother will soon have 90 days. I will also hasten to tell you it ain't the first 90 days mom had. When mom's sober, she comes to meetings. Like a lot of people. But like a lot of people, my mother doesn't stay sober. Because my mother's different. My mother doesn't have to do these things. My mother only comes here when the heat's on. See, my mother is not desperate enough to do these things yet. And my mother may have to die drunk, I don't know. I really don't know. My sponsor, my hard-hearted sponsor that I went to school, went to school for hard-hearted sponsors, told me one night that I had to go to work. And he got me a job down there. I showed up at this job, and a guy wanted to know a dumb thing. He wanted to know what my Social Security card number was. He said, what's your Social Security card number, kid? And I said, what? He said, Social Security card. Don't you have one? I said, no. And he said, uh, how old are you? And I said, I'm 30. <laughs> he said, you don't have a Social Security card? And I said, no, I don't. He said, why not? I said, I've never needed one. <laughs> he said, where have you been all these years? I said, you wouldn't understand if I told you. You know what he did? He took me down and got me a social security card. Put me to work. I couldn't go home and tell my sponsor that they weren't hiring ex-convicts. They weren't hiring. They hired me, put me to work. Damn near killed me out there in them oil fields. Put me to work. Can you imagine a big high rolling adult dealing pimp working in the oil field? <laughs> kind of a humiliating experience. My sponsor wouldn't let me get a car. When I had the money, he, would have, he made me ride my little girl's bicycle to meetings. Right through my old neighborhood. <laughs> I'd ride this bicycle through this old neighborhood and my gang would be standing on the corner. Oh boy, does that AA really work? <laughs> <laughs> now I drive my 1890, 18, my 1989, Corvette Roadster, right by Folsom and honk the horn and say, yes, AA really does work. I, I should tell you that 
I only get loaned that from my wife from time to time. That's <laughs> really her. I get to. Life is good. You know that. Uh, I remember I used to have to go out and find out what people did when they got paid. I didn't know. I used to stand off in a corner of markets and watch. I'd see people come in with their wives and these little kids. They'd stick them in them baskets backwards and push them down the aisle. Throw that stuff in there. You go up there and the guy's standing there with a grave look of concern on his face while that cash register's working. So finally I got a paycheck and by this time my wife had come back and brought that little girl I was never supposed to see. And she's going to have another baby. I said, let's go to the market. She says, we don't need anything. I said, I don't care. We're going to the market anyhow. <laughs> she said, why? And I said, that's what they do when they get paid. <laughs> she said, who? And I said, them. <laughs> Have you ever tried to explain them to those? <laughs> they don't know who they are, really. I mean, after one of them meetings on them, them Alanons will walk up and say, who are them? I'll say, you. <laughs> we went down to the market that day, and she, I had that look, that spiritual look that intoxicate newcomers, you know, like, let's go to the market, bitch, or I'm going to kill you. you know I mean? <laughs> spiritual stuff. We pushed the kid around the thing backward, and she pulled cookies off the shelf, and tore open peanut butter jars and threw them on the floor. It was just a real wonderful experience. <laughs> Trying to look cool all the time. And went home, went to get some money for a haircut and somebody stole her purse. You want to hear somebody scream? Listen to a thief when they get stolen from. <laughs> well, I ran and raved and jumped and hollered. I'll tell you, if I could have caught that guy, you'd have another talker here this morning. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'd be up there in Folsom telling you, hey, hey, don't work, baby. You know? <laughs> That's the theme song of the losers. Hey, hey, don't work. Hell, it don't. Yes, it does. Works very well, thank you. I tell you, you know, a guy told me the other day, a uh, newcomer. You know, newcomers got all kinds of sources of information. <laughs> hey, really do. I mean, if you haven't worked with one later, just lately, just get one. Sit there. God, they'll tell you things you don't even know. <laughs> the guy told me, he said, you know what the difference between a loser and a winner is, Johnny? And I said, what's that? He says, losers do what they want to, winners do what they have to. <laughs> you smart the newcomers are? They're smart. They just got all the answers. They really do. I just didn't listen to them. God, didn't know that. Yeah. Anything else you want to know, Spons? Yeah. Yeah. God, I don't know how I made it before you got here. <laughs> That's another thing the newcomer don't seem to understand. Somehow or other, us old timers survived till you blessed us with your presence. <laughs> but most of us, most of us had a blessing that some of you don't have. Most of us were more indoctrinated in a program of recovery than we are in a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why we're all time. There's a difference. I'm not saying anything against the fellowship. God knows the fellowship is essential. I have to come to a fellowship. I have to have a place to work. I have to have people to talk to. I have to have a sponsor. I have to have a meeting to go to to check my measurements. I have to have some place to come in and sit down and be me. And then no matter what's happening out there in that world, I'm safe and secure here. This is the only place in God's world that I am absolutely and totally safe and secure in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am safe here. The great blessing that's been mine is this, that every once in a while, every once in a while, I am able to take the way I feel here, out there, and apply it in my life for periods of time. You see, these roundups and conventions are magnificent things. The only problem is that tomorrow we wake up in reality. Tomorrow we wake up in the real world. Some of us have to go to work. That's still not a good word, but it's something I have to do. <laughs> but you see, if I can take what I have felt being with you this weekend, 
put it in that car and put it on that plane and take it home with me and take it out there in that world tomorrow and apply it to my life and to the people I do business with on a daily basis and bring it back in and put it into my home group tomorrow night then this roundup would have been a success for me but if I hang the way I feel here on that doorway as I walk out of it and I go back out of that world and I become an overbearing, anxious, irresponsible, inconsiderate asshole, <laughs> then this thing will just be a memory. I have to be able to take this into the meetings that I go to, this feeling that we have. There's a, there's a feeling of love and togetherness in this room. I felt this weekend you could, you could just whack it with a knife and cut it and take it with you. That's what's here. But you see, that's the healing commodity for alcoholics in love. That's the, that's the separation that separates us from the rest of the world. We love one another, not because we're perfect, for Christ's sakes, but because we all have a little single flaw in our makeups that made us alcoholic. What it is, I don't know. What it is, a strange thing that makes me alcoholic, that makes me different from my fellows, I don't know. The book says that I have to, I have to, smash the idea or the illusion that someday I'm going to control and enjoy my drink. And the idea that I am different has to be smashed. I'm just like you. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not going to be like those other people out there. Thank God I know that. And I've had all kinds of things happen to me since I've been sober. You know, I've been through my wife committing suicide. I raised those two little girls. I've been through business failures. My sponsor died. My Father in Alcoholics Anonymous died. My mother in Alcoholics Anonymous died. The people who raised me died. I went through a divorce from a long time marriage. It seems to be the thing that's catching on nowadays. I don't know what's going on out there. I really don't know. I'm just, I don't know what happens like Sharon was talking about. And by the way, I, I want to tell you something that, I, that I've been thinking about. I know all the speakers. I know Jerome, I saw Jerome come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew Vince, I saw Vince. I was that guy Vince talked about when he came to his first meeting. I'm the only guy who's ever known him since the day he came to Alcoholics Anonymous in this instant. I watched him through all that and I watched Sharon come into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to tell you something. These are fine, fine, fine members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Good members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know them, folks. I don't just see them stand here in their fineries and talk. I see them in action in their home group where it counts. I see them working with newcomers, and I see them at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I do the things and see them do the things they do. So I know they're good members of Alcoholics. I can't say that about a lot of people I've heard talk in some places, but I can say it. I tell you. I just hope and pray to God they're as proud of being here with me this weekend as I've been with them, I'll tell you that. I'm proud to be with them. If I'm allowed to have that word in my vocabulary, that's the pride I feel of being able to associate with these good people. You good people. My life is taken into a new dimension. Fifth, fourth dimension, hell, I'm in the 17th dimension somewhere. I don't know where I'm at most of the time. <laughs> I wander around out there. You know, I live long periods of time and never want anything for myself. It's amazing to me. The guy as selfish and self-centered as I am don't want nothing for me. It's amazing. My wife said to me, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I don't know. What do you want? I said, I don't need nothing. She looks at me like I'm nuts. I mean, you ever told an alcoholic what you want? They'd say, I really don't know. I don't need anything. Hell, they usually give you a shopping list. <laughs> But it's true. And just because I've been doing things around here. Now, what's my life like? I'm going to tell you what my life's like by telling you a little story. I love this little story. It says so much without saying a lot, really. Everybody that knows me knows there's one thing in the world I love to do. And what Barbara doesn't tell you, that the reason that I don't uh, have a tough time getting to seaside is because that... Uh, convention that I was going to happen to be at Augusta, Georgia two weeks, two years in a row, the one that's going on this weekend. But she caught me before I made my reservation to Augusta this year, so I'm stuck. <laughs> no, but my, uh, 
That's why I love to play golf. Everybody knows that. And a few years ago, a company I was working for bought me a membership in a very exclusive country club. And I'm out there playing golf, and I'm walking down the fairway one Wednesday and playing golf with a couple of doctors. <laughs> got a short sleeve shirt on. On my arm, I got things like daggers through skulls with blood dripping from them. <laughs> Little panthers with their sides shot out, you know. And then there's a few homemade things, you know what I mean? Just real conversation pieces in the coffee shop, I'll tell you that. Little doctor looked at me and he said, you have big forearms, Johnny. And I said, I sure do. He said, you ever played baseball? I said, every time I went to jail. <laughs> he looked at me and he went, oh. <laughs> you've never been in jail. Well, I never told him any different. I'm kind of glad. See, he told me his story, this little doctor. He's a little Jewish guy. He lived in the Bronx in New York. He's in an orphanage. This little Jewish guy, bound and determined, self-made guy, man, he worked and he studied and he sacrificed, he did without, he took himself out of that orphanage. Then he worked and he studied and he sacrificed, he did without, he put himself to school, to medical school, he became a doctor. Then he saved his money, worked and he studied and sacrificed, and he bought a house, he joined the country club and he plays golf on Wednesdays. Man, he worked and he studied, a self-made man. Worked, studied, sacrificed and did without, and he did all that stuff all his life. See, I can't tell him. I spent my entire lifetime running in and out of penitentiaries and nut houses up and down the street using and abusing and destroying people and got sober and ended up in the same place he did. <laughs> and the reason I can't tell him is because he don't believe me. I even showed him the scars once. I said, that's where I used to stick that heroin. He said, huh, that tattoo probably got infected. They can't, they can't believe, they can't take you from there and stand you there, they just, it, it just, it's impossible. But you see, very few have ever reckoned with the will of God either. The power of God, the power of Almighty God in a human being's life. See, God ain't given up on none of us. The doctors gave up on me, the psychiatrists gave up on me, the preachers, the teachers, the wardens, the, all of them, they all gave up on me, told me I'm hopeless. I got papers in Sacramento to prove I'm nuts by some of the better doctors in the world. <laughs> and yet the only therapy I've ever applied in my life has been a program called Alcoholics Now. <laughs> and yet, from time to time, I have said in these rooms and I have heard things from this podium like this, people will say to you, AA ain't enough. Anybody who would ever tell you AA ain't enough ain't tried AA. <laughs> because I don't know anybody who lives any better than I do, and I ain't ever tried nothing else but AA. I said to these old timers one day, what is my sobriety? Where did it come from? How come I've got it? And this old lady I love by the name of Myrtle Snyder said to me, Honey, your sobriety is a gift from God. Being the type of person I was, I said, I don't want to owe God nothing. What do I do for God? Now, Alkies are. We don't want to be indebted. <laughs> she laughed and smiled. Like they do with them old timers. It's that smile, little grin they got, you know. What you do with your sobriety, she said to me, would be your gift to God. I have thought about that for a long, long time. Matter of fact, I don't think about much of anything else. My sobriety is the most priceless gift that I possess. I do nothing to put it in jeopardy. I live nowhere contrary to the teaching to this program of Alcoholic Anonymous. I'm a basic human being and I make mistakes, sure. And my mistakes usually hurt other people, sure. But my sobriety, is my most priceless gift. I do nothing to put it in jeopardy. If what I did with my sobriety would be my gift back to my loving Father God, I would only live with one prayer on my lips from now, forever, and evermore. I would only pray that my loving Father God would be as pleased with my gift to him today as I've been with his for 29 years. Thank you. <laughs>